So again, I just want to say welcome to Liquid Margins. And this episode is called Where's Class? Meet Your Students in the Margins. Today's wonderful guest, Carmen Johnston. She's an English professor at Chabot College. And Denise Meduli Williams, she's associate professor at San Diego Miramar College. And then our wonderful moderator today, Erin Barker, um, with the virtual background. I'm outing your background there. <laughs> but uh, this is my real office. I don't know what you're talking it's about. It's your real office. She's she's she doesn't even have to work for a living. She's, you know, she's that. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and that's it. I'm going to turn it over to you now, Erin, and um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, today in Liquid Margins, we're talking about how you use social annotation across a variety of contexts. When your students are, they may be in a hybrid learning format, they may be online, they may be in person, they may be a mixture of all of the above, right? Um, but to kick all that off, I want to hear a bit about your teaching background and your specialties. So what um, do you specialize in? What is your passion? And then I, the follow-up question is, who are your students? And Carmen, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some more think time on this one. And Carmen, we're gonna start with you. So go ahead. Um, so I'll start off with um, my college. I teach at a community college. Um, in Hayward, California, which is in the Bay Area. Um, and I've been at Chabot College for 15 years. Um, and I am an English teacher at Chabot. And so um, in the community college, at least at our college, English teacher means you teach everything. So I teach creative writing, I teach literature, I teach composition, I teach pre-transfer level composition. Um, our courses are, we do not separate reading and writing. So the courses we teach reading and writing together. Um, so I, I, it's hard to say what a specialty is. I love teaching literature. I really, really enjoy teaching literature. Um, in our courses, our English one, which is a freshman comp is usually like a nonfiction course. Um, and I enjoy teaching that also, um, but probably literature is my favorite. And I often get to teach a, um, a black lit course as well. Um, I am... Um, I teach in a program called Change It Now, which is a social justice learning community. So about half of my load of teaching is really focused. I mean, I teach social justice in all my courses, but uh, the Change It Now is more like a cohort of students. So there's students that I usually have for a whole year together. And so we're able to create a lot of community. Um, and Chabot is, I would say it's predominantly a, a campus of students of color. So uh, mostly Latino students, Asian, Black, Pacific Islander, um, and Asian in all the diversity of what Asian means. Um, um, Arab students, um, we have white students at our school, but definitely they are the smaller um, population. Um, so it's a very diverse group of students, uh, mostly working class and low income students. Um, students who you know maybe couldn't afford to go off to college right away or didn't have the grades or just want to save money you know it's just it's community college is such an affordable option um, and just brilliant lovely wonderful students that i just adore um yeah so that's i forget what your other question did i answer all the questions <laughs> I think you got most of it. And if you didn't, I promise I'm not grading you today. Okay, uh, so you. at the end of the session, I'm not going to say, Carmen, you get it. Um, <laughs> no, <point. laughs> no, <point. laughs> um, no, that's perfect. Denise, do you want to talk to us about what you teach your specialties and who your students are? Sure. I'm, I, I love that Carmen got to go first so I could listen in and prepare myself. Um, I also am a community college English professor. I love teaching community college. You know that I love this phrase that we accept the top 100% of students and we're here to support all students reach their goals. Um, I've been a community college educator now for 21 years. Um, and I teach at San Diego Miramar College. Um, I teach English, but I also teach um, English language learners. Um, and in my district, we call that ELAC, uh, English Language Acquisition. Um, and much like Carmen, my student body, um, the students in my classes are, are very diverse. 
So there's not one predominant, you know, um, native language in the courses that I teach. Uh, we're focused on getting um, students um, prepared um, for academic English and content courses in our um, English language acquisition courses, you know, multiple skills, reading, writing, um, listening, speaking, grammar, vocabulary, um, American, you know, college, culture, all of that kind of mixed in it together. Um, I'd like to say too that I just love how my the students I have in one classroom it'll you know I'll have students from 18 years old to 80 all together you know new immigrants refugees returning students um, uh, I don't even international students just it's a huge mix and it is such a joy to be there learning with them and to be supporting them um, you know with their goals um, and we've had some good times working together online hybrid um, during the pandemic, and we had been doing that in our program before the pandemic, so we were able to move into that um, fairly smoothly in terms of the technology, obviously during a pandemic, there's so many other issues that make it very, very, very challenging, um, but our students stayed with us and I just have really enjoyed um, working with them. And we're going to get to some of those challenges. Trust me, all my questions are leading somewhere. Uh, my next question for the two of you is what are your top three strengths as an educator? So I want you to think on that for a sec. Everyone else who's attending, I also want you to answer that question in the chat. What are your top three strengths as an educator? And if you're a librarian or a teacher or a professor or an administrator, you are still an educator. So I'm curious about your top three strengths. And Denise, guess what? You're going first on this one. Oh no. All right, so right off the top of my head, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that I am always a learner. I think I just mentioned that. I'm actually um, a learner right now um, in graduate work, but I think that always having the lear a learner's mindset myself, um, being a student, always trying to improve, be creative, roll with it, understand what it feels like to have to ask for an extension, to do something that I've never done before, to be confused. That I think is very much a strength as a learner, even though I've been in the field and, and teaching for over two decades now, knowing that I'm still learning, I think really um, is a strength of mine when I'm teaching or facilitating with students. I am completely student focused. My whole um, just my, my focus is always um, providing equitable access for students, for their voices, for their experiences, um, for their learning, um, their activities. Um, I, I'm under evaluation right now, but I always joke that whenever I'm under evaluation, when people come in the room, they can never find me. Like, where's Denise? And even in the online setting, where's Denise, right? Because the students are the center. Um, so that's an, that that's something that I think. So what is that too? <laughs> I'm talking on the fly here. A learner, student focus. Um, I think that I express empathy for students, and they know that they can come to me, and then I'm here for them. I think it's really really challenging um, to be in a new country, to be navigating a college system, um, to be doing that sometimes alone or with family and supporting children or, or partners who have come here for work. Um, and they're, you know, I think they, that students really, really need to know that the relationship with the instructor comes before the pedagogy and that I'm here for them no matter what. Passing I, the ball to you, Carmen. <laughs> I'm taking notes on that one, which is the relationship comes before the pedagogy. Thank you for answering that first. And thank you for having such a great answer. Um, I'll tell you why I asked this question in a minute. Carmen, you're up. Well, I would say that my <clears throat> my number one, um, I don't know, my best catch attribute as an instructor is my commitment to racial justice and equity um, and just how that plays out in everything from the books that I teach, from the way that I teach, to building relationships with students, that that is like my primary concern, um, is making sure that my classroom is a safe space for everybody and that we're able to have real talk um, and challenge oppressive structures and think about institutionalized oppression and give students the language to, um, to describe their lives and their experience. Um, so I feel like that is like my, the best thing about me as an instructor is my, 
commitment to racial justice and equity inside the classroom and outside of the classroom as well, that I'm very much interested in institutional transformation. Um, and I think having that commitment has allowed me to challenge myself to make sure that I'm always, you know, practicing what I preach, that if I believe this, if I believe things to be a certain way, if I have a vision for the world to make sure that that vision is happening inside of my classroom also, right? And giving my students a lot of agency so that we can co-create the classroom space and content and um, everything together. Um, so really trying to make my classroom like an oasis away from the oppressive structures that our students have to deal with. And I think particularly for community college students, the challenges that they're up against um, are, are very powerful and, and varied. I think as you had stated, like being refugees, being um, current immigrants, um, often just having to work or take care of family members, often in families, there's struggles happening. So I really want my classroom to be a place that um, is just safe and um, giving and offering some respite from the oppressive, oppressive um, things that our students have to face outside the classroom. Um, I also would say that I'm really fun. Um, I'm very funny. I will say that I'm a fun teacher. I like to have fun. I do icebreakers in my class all the time. I want my students to feel like when they come into the classroom that they're walking into a party. Um, so I really try to create an, an atmosphere of fun and play. Um, and I mean, I think that's one of the things I like about Hypothesis that it really does fit into like this, this the, the play, the playfulness that you can have inside of a classroom. Um, and I believe that I've always believed since I was a student, you know, since a young student that learning should be fun. Like that is a core belief of mine that it should be fun, why not? Um, so that is really important to me. And I try to have a lot of fun in my classroom and, and also just, um, the ability to build community, you know, I mean, all of my students has, have always said that my class is the class number one where they know each other, they know each other's names, um, and they feel like they can be themselves. And I just think that that is just such an important um, aspect that I get to offer them is that this is just a place where they get to be themselves. So they don't have to front, they don't have to pretend, they can make mistakes, they can tell jokes, they can show who they are. Um, and I feel like, yeah, that that is one of my, my strengths is just being able to build community inside of my classroom. So I, um, first off, I love the pointing out of knowing students' names and calling them by the correct name. Um, I was a middle school teacher for a long time and that was really important to me as well uh, because our students in community college as well, they move from class to class all the time, right? And it's easy to be seen as just another body in the room or another number or somebody to be graded, to, you know? Uh, and so it starts with something so simple as using the correct name with our students. Uh, so I asked that question for two reasons. First off, because I think you need to brag on yourselves more. Um, I think the last year has been really difficult for everyone in education, no matter the context, no matter the way you teach, no matter, you know, any of that, right? And so we need to brag on ourselves more, which is also why I asked everyone in the chat to do the same, because we need to recognize what we're good at. The second reason I asked that is because I was mining information from you. Um, Every teacher has like what, two objectives, right? The clear objective and the underlying objective. Um, so one of the things that both of you talked about was this idea of relationship before pedagogy. And now we're gonna hop into using hypothesis. You knew it was getting there and social annotation. Talk to me about how you've used hypothesis and social annotation and then how that helps build relationships in your classrooms or in your courses. Um, so I'm gonna add that question in the chat while you think about it. And Denise or Carmen, one of you can go first if you want to volunteer. <laughs> okay, well. I can I'm go. <laughs> I'm still thinking, go ahead, Carmen. <laughs> yeah, I can go. Um, well, I gather my thoughts. Yeah. Uh, well, I first just have to say that I was introduced to hypothesis by my colleague, Monique Williams, who is like a total, she's just 
very tech savvy and she always knows like all the cool you know apps to try on canvas and so she had explored hypothesis and she was using it and she you know um kind of did like a little workshop with our department and i you know i i like that i like learning um apps and things like that too so i was very intrigued by this and i think particularly as english instructors you know annotation is just so important i feel like it's the number one skill that we can teach our students and it's the skill that's going to help them in all of their classes so i feel like in the past when we were um, pre-pandemic and face-to-face -face, i would you know always come by my students when we'd reading a book and like check their annotations and we'd spend a lot of time working on annotation and how important it is and checking it and um i feel like one of the cool things about hypothesis is that it kind of does a lot of the work for you you know so it's in canvas so i can just look through it and then just kind of grade it from there um but to your question in regards to like how it helps build relationships so often you know, as I was talking about earlier, like just my um, pedagogical stance around just racial justice and equity. So I am, you know, 90% of all the readings that I use are by people of color and the, and the, the context, right? The issues are so important to our students. And so when they're reading and annotating, they're reading about things that, you know, impact their lives and that are really important to them. And so often, you know, I might ask them to, um, you know, identify, you know, three golden lines from a poem or something like that, right? Like three lines that stand out to you and they get to highlight and then also to respond to two other people, right? So that's one of the ways that, you know, the relationship building happens. And then when we're in class, you know, we'll pull those golden lines and um, especially on Zoom, we might put them on a Padlet and people can comment or they might go into a breakout room and share their golden lines from the hypothesis activity and, and come up with one that they think is the most powerful. So they're having these opportunities to talk to each other about these lines um, from the literature that really speak to them and how it connects to their own lives. And um, I think that naturally you know, builds relationship and community because they're so great at when we have that larger discussion, you know, they'll say, oh, well, so and so, yeah, well, you say what you said in the room about that because that was really cool or, oh, I really liked what uh, Marissa said, Marissa, you know, can you speak to this? And so it really helps um, build that community and have them see each other as scholars because that's also a really big um, a really big piece of my class is I want them to identify as scholars, right? As readers, writers, and thinkers. And so when they're in there with hypothesis, pulling out these golden lines, talking to each other and recognizing each other as scholars, um, I think it really helps them strengthen their relationships and build our community of learners together. And Carmen, just to follow up, are you providing, when you're giving that, it sounds like you are, but just to clarify, when you're giving them say a poem and you're asking them to annotate this poem, are you doing that online or in class? So the annotations are usually online, right? So we, you know, upload it into Canvas with hypothesis and they'll go in there and they will um, annotate it um, as homework, right? So they're kind of doing that work before they come to class. And so then when we come to class, we can look at it together. And then, um, there is the classes in person is that correct right now my classes are all on zoom because of pan because of the <laughs> pandemic yeah so i have one class that's asynchronous so we don't see each other at all um and so it's a little bit trickier you know having them figure out how to um take those what they've you know um reviewed on the annotations um sometimes i might put them in like a group discussion so that they can talk about it and work from it there but on Zoom, we'll do it together in my other class. Got it. Thanks for clarifying. I was trying to picture what was happening. Yeah, um, Denise, I mean, my campus you? is oh, on camp. I'm sorry, I was just gonna say part of my campus is on, part of my college is on campus right now, but I just chose this semester to stay online. Denise, what about you? Sorry, Karen. <laughs> sure. The I'm in the same position, Carmen, we're kind of, it's like that middle road, right, where in-person kind of happened, also then remote for those people that were in person for two weeks and blah, blah, blah. So I'm still online as well, um, by choice. 
Um, and my classes are all online asynchronous and have been. Um, and I love uh, using collaborative annotation for this reason, because in an online async class, you have to have student interaction and instructor presence, right? They have to feel that everyone is there, that they're not moving through this class alone in the dark, in a self-paced way, individually. They need to feel part of a community in order to be successful. Um, and I, what um, Carmen just mentioned is very complementary to what I do as well in my English courses, but I'll, so I'll speak specifically to my um, English language acquisition courses. What I love about using any type of collaborative annotation is it really, I believe, equitizes the student voice. So whether we are in person in the classroom or on Zoom Live, you know, there's always going to be the three loudest students. And we have all been teaching a very long time and we know all of the pedagogical moves to make sure that we have, you know, equitable, equitable discussions and we have wait time and we do small groups. But the, the truth of the matter is, and I was like this growing up, it can be very hard for, for students, especially learning another language to speak up um, in person or on Zoom on the spot when you ask them something about a reading. It can also, um, with um, language learning, um, a long time ago I learned German, so I just really remember this. What we think is enough wait time is never enough wait time. So when you ask a question, what do you think about this reading? Or what's, you know, what's your golden line? I do that as well. And then the three you know, quickest students are ready and then the other ones are like still trying to figure out exactly what is the question, right? And processing that. So on Hypothesis or on any collaborative annotation tool online, students have the time and the space to read carefully, to prepare what they want to say. And sometimes the quietest voice in the classroom is the, is the loudest online and you get to hear everybody's voice Everyone has the space to do it in an equitable way. Um, and I feel like that's the best way for student interaction. I also just know from surveying students and from interviewing that they are done with discussion boards, at least in my experience, it is like the new death by PowerPoint, death by discussion board, post once, reply twice, right? So for especially language learning, if you're interacting with the text and you're annotating and you're seeing the, the lines that you wanna use in your essay later, um, a lot of times the prop I'll use is like, what do you notice? What do you think? What questions do you have? And then they're like, oh, a lot of people have the same question. I don't feel silly that I didn't understand what this part was. And then I can go in and add it in. Um, and so it does allow for students to build that community um, in a way that is not um, like punitive or on the spot. They can take that time um, to respond and they can see each other and interact kind of in a more lively fashion, depending on how you set it up. I don't, um, I don't like police the language or the quality of their responses the same way I wouldn't in a classroom ask people to speak only in complete sentences with, you know, correct standardized English like you like a GIF or GIF, whatever team you're on and how you pronounce it can be just as powerful of a response to a line than a, you know, paragraph written in standard English with, you know, topic sentences. So being able to respond in ways that um, is comfortable for them and that they are, um, that they think is fun and lively really gets people into um, understanding, I think, um, the reading or the document or the chart or whatever, the image, um, even more than, than you would in a discussion board, in my experience. Choosing mothers choose Jeff. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. <laughs> no, it's gift. Um, <laughs> I can't decide. I just like say it both ways whenever I have to say it. <laughs> I, I really like that both of you are talking um, about this idea of hypothesis as a safe space to express yourself. And I have to agree with you, Denise, like it's death by discussion board. Um, I myself am a doctorate student and every week when I have to do discussion boards in Canvas, I want to bang my head against the wall um, and wonder if it's actually beneficial to me um, and I'm actually learning or getting anything out of it. Um, and I desperately wish that my school used hypothesis. They're going to rename, they're going to remain unnamed for right now. Um, but yeah, and so this idea of hypothesis as a safe space, especially in an online learning environment, especially in this past year or two years or maybe coming up three years <laughs> um, is intriguing to me. And I think uh, really gets at where we want our students to be, right? Like they can't come to the table and learn academic material unless they feel safe, both emotionally um, and socially um, and academically. 
And so I'm curious, you guys kind of touched on this a bit, if you could give some specific examples of uh, maybe students or assignments that you've given where Hypothesis has provided a safe space for them to express themselves where maybe they have not expressed themselves before, if you have one. And speaking of things time, I've been terrible about it. I say 30 seconds, but then like 10 seconds later, you have to say something. Just brief, this popped into my head because we had just been talking about like icebreakers and names and things. And um, in one of my um, courses, we the first thing that we um, annotate is the chapter called The F Word by Firuza Duma from her book, Funny and Farsi. I have a lot of Iranian students as well. Um, but it's all about how her name Firuza was the F word and how no one could say it right. And all these things, she changed her name. Like a lot of my students will say, you know, my name is this in their first language, but just call me Jane. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not calling you Jane. We're going to learn to pronounce your name correctly. And we're all going to call each other by, you know, unless you really want, you don't change it for me. Right. Um, so this reading is all about how Firuza changed her name to Julie and then she got married and then her name was Julie Dumas and then it was like nothing, it not, didn't match her, right? And then she tried to go back, but it was this knot of her professional life and then her family called her one name and then her, she had kids and was trying to figure this all out. Um, so this, this space for students to engage with like, what do you think about how she changed her name? And then also reflect on, oh, should I change my name? Or did someone in a previous class change my name for me? Did someone tell me your name's too hard? So let's just shorten it, which is terrifying that this is happening, but it does happen to, to my students sometimes. Um, so it provided that kind of safe space for students to engage with a topic that's highly interesting, names, right? And a chance to introduce themselves in this interactive way and learn how to use hypothesis or how to use the collaborative annotation tool because it's, it's a whole um, cognitive overload if you're learning the technology tool and you're learning a really hard, or you're you know annotating a, a text that's like pretty, a lot of content right off and you're learning new, uh, for my students, new grammar and vocabulary and um, sentence structure, right? So trying to, to step into it so that we just do it in a, in a fun way, in a topic that makes sense, get through the tech issues. And then as we move throughout the semester, then we can focus on topics and um, readings and charts and graphs and things that are, are deeper knowledge or that could be more advanced for them, but we're no longer worried about the technology of how to use that, right? Um, and then the last thing I would say about just all of that is that it's a lot, a lot of um, just the, the tools are sometimes presented as things for students to consume pa uh, passively, like you're just going to watch this, or you're going to listen to this lecture, or you're going to read this and then take a quiz, but it's just like all passive, right? And so what I love about collaborative annotation is that they're actively involved and the discussion takes them where they want to go. I love that comparison between passive learning and active learning using social annotation and hypothesis. And it's funny, Denise, because now I'm like considering all my assignments that I do for my doctorate program. <laughs> I'm like, passive, passive, pa anyway. Um, that's a whole nother conversation for another I'm in a doctorate program work. too, and same, just did that. <laughs> <laughs> Carmen, what about you? Well, you know, I was thinking a lot about a couple of things. I mean, one is um, I'm doing in my literature class right now, we're doing um, the theme of the class is called Resist the Canon, right? And so we're talking a lot about the, liter the literary canon and about students' experiences in high school and the books that they've read. And we started the, the course off um, by reading a short article called Mirror, Mirror Windows and Sliding Doors. Um, and it's actually about children's literature and the, and the importance of having diverse authors and that each book could be a mirror, a window, or a sliding door. Um, and so, you know, it was the first kind of hypothesis assignment that we did in the class. And I really liked it because it was very introductory, right? So I think very similar to what you're talking about, Denise, like, and it's a, it's a very simple article to read. Um, but powerful. And so as they're learning hypothesis, right, they, they're engaging in something that, is, and, and also just really speaks to them because they get an opportunity to talk about, you know, the books that they read and what, what books were mirror windows and sliding doors um, and the books that weren't, right? And so on the, 
on the annotated side, you can see them having a conversation about, oh, I read that book and I hated the great Gatsby or, you know, Catcher in the Rye and like, I'm um, having those conversations too. So I think, you know, it's, I feel like part of it is hypothesis and part of it is the text itself, that the text itself provides. And I think this is similar to what you're talking about that, you know, when you choose these texts that really speak to our students and that's where that discussion can come alive, right? Um, and it becomes a, a safe space for them to have conversations that they've never really had a, had an opportunity to talk about. Like I can imagine for many students that there isn't really a lot of space for them to talk about their names and the oppression that they face. I mean, I know so many students that have had, you know, maybe they say their, their name in their, their home language. Um, and then the teacher says, well, I'm just gonna call you Charlie, right? And so there often isn't a lot of spaces for them to talk about that. So I can imagine Denise with an assignment like that, that it would just be super vibrant and, and opportunity for students to share these hurts actually that they've experienced in education. And a lot of my students, when we were talking about the mirror windows and sliding doors, they started to become very upset because they realized that there was so much knowledge that had been held from them, you know, so many, um, books that they could have read um, that the teachers in their K through 12 just didn't choose to to share with them. And so I think it can also build, there's that safety, but it can also be um, build a lot of camaraderie amongst the students. I like this idea of like flipping the script on academics to some degree, right? We've talked about like passive learning and students not being able to access academics or learning um, and that not to sound like a marketing professional because I'm not in marketing, but that hypothesis can help flip that script so that students can then access um, the academics, can then discuss the academics and then feel safe discussing it together, um, whether they are asynchronous or synchronous or hybrid <laughs> or in person, <laughs> pick your option of the week. Um, so my next question for you is, as you're thinking about the rest of the term or the next year, is how do you plan to use social annotation differently or similarly um, looking ahead? Um, this is kind of um, correlated to that, but I'm just going to address some things in the in the chat about discussion board related to um to collaborative annotation because i think that's part of it so i i, I guess i should <laughs> i said death by discussion board i still believe that there are good ways to use discussion boards i love doing small groups i love doing um peer review but i think that whole group discussions you know that post once reply twice every week for every type of reading is too much and i think from my interviews with students, remember that they're not just usually taking one class. So I was talking to students who had four classes or three classes and that they were doing a discussion board in every class every week. That is definitely death by discussion. It's just too much, right? So for me, um, moving forward, I, I, I don't, I, I like, it's another activity, right? It's like, we have this toolbox of activities that we use um, at the appropriate times for the type of, of content or our goals for the course or where our students um, are thriving, right? Or where we want to bring them. So sometimes I'll do um, some readings um, that are collaborative annotations. Sometimes we'll do a small group discussion board instead. Sometimes we'll do a Flipgrid. Sometimes we'll post the, um, you know, the golden line on a Padlet along with an image or, you know, so like using it, not like I only use hypothesis, but like using it in ways throughout the semester. And I have also felt that I think we learned a lot of tools during the pandemic because everyone went remote um, and now we want to leverage continually leverage those tools moving forward no matter what type of um, like modality we're in so it's not like oh we're in person now we'll never use this right just like Carmen is saying this is a great way to use it for a prep for the in person for homework so everyone reads it everyone's discussing as an instructor we know the common themes or questions and then we come to the class and we can have a more fruitful discussion um so I think weaving it in no matter the modality and with the other more traditional things is the way that I'll continue to use it what about you Carmen 
Yeah, I was just gonna say ditto. I mean, I don't know if I have a much more to add, but I really like what you're saying, Denise, in regards to it being a tool, right? And you use it amongst the other tools that you use. Um, and I don't, I mean, I have to say, I don't actually use the discussion board that much. So it's interesting to hear people, um, just to hear, you know, the death by discussion board. So it's really got me thinking a lot about how I use it and when I use it. Um, I saw on one of my colleagues, um, Canvas site, they actually break students up into small groups and use the discussion board that way. So they're just having a discussion amongst mm. like five people. And I thought that was a real intriguing way um, to use the discussion board because I think it makes it less um, overwhelming for students, you know, if you're just kind of building with five people and having that conversation. So I think trying to use the annotations in that way. Um, you know, one thing that my mentor Monique, who I mentioned earlier, um, showed me was to like, just on the document itself, kind of doing your own annotations and saying like, oh, well, pulling out a quote, what do you think about this particular quote and having the students respond on hypothesis or, you know, having little pointers and questions. So I'd like to do more of that kind of um, putting questions on the text itself and then having them use hypothesis um, to respond to the to things that I want them to think about in the text in addition to the things that they're highlighting. Um, and I think always just trying to figure out, you know, creative ways and to how to how to use it in a playful way like you were mentioning I love Flipgrid, um, Padlet, uh, maybe making collages doing wordles, you know, I just feel like trying to make it as fun and creative for the students as possible. I think what you're talking about too, Carmen, in terms of putting the questions in almost like pre-annotating yeah. before the students access the text, it's almost a way to think about guiding students through the reading as well right. um, and helping them access the text. I mean, even those of us who have years of education look at sometimes look at some of these texts and are like, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, mind blown, right? Like I need to read this eight different times. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I like that a lot. I have a lot of um, professors who actually do something very similar. Uh, so I know that we are over time. There are some questions in the chat. Franny, do you want to help me um, grab yeah. those? Yeah, and also, Erin, um, our guests have agreed to stay a bit longer. And um, I'm not sure what your schedule is, if you have to leave, but maybe you can go till around 10 as well. Yeah, so let's... Um, First off, I want to like, I, I'm inspired by both Denise and Carmen <laughs> today. Uh, I, this is why I love my job um, and getting to work and talk with educators across the country uh, because I learned so much. And also I just continue to think that we have so many inspiring educators um, and we need to continue to recognize all of you and the work that you're doing um, every day. So let's take a look at some of the questions in the chat. Uh, this is, I think, a follow-up to what we have just talked about. Uh, Denise and Carmen, there's a question from, and uh, I'm going to mispronounce this. And so Isaura, if I'm saying that incorrectly, please, please let me know. Um, do you require students to make a specific number of annotations and do you think it matters? I tend to ask for a specific amount of annotation. Sometimes it's, I mean, I think it really depends. Like we were just looking at, um, what were we just looking at? Oh, we were just looking at uh, excerpt from um, a novel called Brown Girls. Um, and we were talking about language and style. So I asked them to like pick their five top words from the, from the piece and two golden lines, right? And so I do, I think it's just really important to be specific with students. Um, and it and it is graded and it's mostly like you did it or you didn't do it. It's not like, you know, I'm not commenting on the annotations, but just making sure they did it because we're going to use it in class. You know, when we get back together, we're going to talk about it. And I feel like, you know, for English teachers, one of the hardest, <laughs> you know, one of the hardest things is, is getting our students to read and be accountable for the reading, you know. Um, and so I feel like hypothesis for me really helps with that because it's, they can do it right on the page. I can see that they've done it. And I know then that we're gonna have a really fruitful and productive discussion in class. And 
it's kind of one of the things for me as an instructor that I tell them, like, basically, you know, there's only a couple of things that you have to do in an English class. And one of them is read, like you just have to, you know, or else we're not going to be able to do, it's kind of like if you're a carpenter, you wouldn't go to your job site without your tools, you know, like you're not going to be able to do your job. So you have to read. And it's kind of the thing that I'm like, I will freaking kill you if you haven't at least read the book. So I feel like hypothesis is really helpful for me as an English instructor, just keeping them accountable um, for the reading. Yeah, very um, similarly to you, Carmen. I love that um, carpenter um, analogy as well. Um, you know, I do, I think that being very specific on the expectations is super important, right? So similarly, depending on what the topic is or what we're doing, I often have them annotate mentor texts or, or types of writing that we're going to work on. So like, what do you, you know, what do you notice about this section? How do they incorporate this quote? How do you, what do you think about this last line? You know, so, so being very specific of what I want them to do in each one. Um, but I do just give completion points. I do not grade for quality of responses. Um, what I do instead of like, uh, instead of reading it, their, their comments to look for quality, I just engage during uh, on, in hypothesis with them. So I will give certain questions. And then if someone has a short answer or something funny, I'll, I'll ask like for further thoughts or I'll add on another question. And so I'm modeling that interaction. And, and that's where my, um, that's where my time is spent is interacting with them, not judging them. Franny, you yeah. wanted to say something, I can see it. <laughs> Everyone can always tell by my face when I want to say something. Uh, there was a question from Casey in the chat. Um, we might have already kind of covered this, but she wants to know, like, along with safe space, how can hypothesis help build community and connection through interactions? I haven't used it that way before. Please provide any suggestions. And I'm thinking maybe she is uh, that what comes to mind in that question is this idea of requiring students to reply to each other or to look back at each other's annotations, possibly. Um, and I think maybe she's asking Denise and Carmen if you require that, what that would look like. I mean, yeah, I, I do require that on some of them, not all the time, but sometimes I do require them to um, speak back to each other. I mean, often, especially in my class where it's where we have our Zoom meetings, we're going to use the annotations. And so that's the spot where they will, um, you know, they'll go back to their hypothesis to find the quote or the golden line, and they'll have a discussion with each other, um, you know, when we're in our breakout rooms. But I would say to me, the thing that's going to hypothesis is the tool it's the content that's going to really spark the discussion and spark the community and connection so i think it's really about you know being very um, thoughtful about the text that you choose and how is it going to speak to the students is it exciting is it something that matters to them is it something they can relate to is it something that's um I don't not not controversial but that's just powerful um i think it really starts with the text that you that you use and then like we were talking about the hypothesis is the tool right so it's hypothesis isn't going to do it on its own you definitely have to make sure that you're picking the right text yeah i definitely agree with that and i also think that when you let go of requiring i mean there is expectations we're going to all like answer these questions and comment and all of this and i expect you to do a couple to your your classmates but students will do way more when they're invested in it so you have an amazing text that speaks to them and they understand how to use the tool and they see me in there they're chatting with each other i'll open it and be like what just happened overnight you know all these interactions um, because they're invested in the community that they built, they built, not me, and they're invested in the conversation that's happening around a text that speaks to them. Um, and then you can, then you're not worried about did everyone do it three times because everyone's done more than that. Granny wants to say something. <laughs> I have no poker face. 
<laughs> yeah, I actually had a question. I had a question that I've been wondering for a long time. Um, it's pretty general. Um, so, you know, we talked about building community and that seems to be successful with this. And so what happens to um, competition? Does that go away? Because, you know, when you're in college, when I was in college, it seemed to be very competitive, you know, and there was always that person in the class, never me, who was like the most competitive. And, and those people were kind of intimidating, I think. But, but you know, I, I think competition can be healthy and unhealthy. And so how can, if you could just talk about that, if that question is clear. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's because I'm at a community college, but competition isn't a thing um, at our level. Um, I think students are more in competition with themselves because they're trying to transfer. You know, I don't think they're like trying to get a better, they're trying to get an A for themselves so they can go to Cal. They're not like, I need to be the top whatever in the class. So there's not a lot. I, I mean, I, I haven't seen students be competitive with each other, more with themselves and trying to, you know, get the grades they need to get to their next goal. I don't know. What I feel the same way. Doing. I feel like Carmen and I faces like looked the same. <laughs> we saw that we're both like, hmm. I mean, I think it's it starts from the beginning of the student body, but also the class, right? Like we're not grading on curves. You're not competing. Like this class is not built on competition. I want everyone to get an A. I want everyone to succeed. I'm helping everyone reach their goals. We are absolutely not in competition with each other. And and I don't I don't often feel that from my students either. It's not a thing. That's I great. mean, just. Just to add to that, I mean, I think there may be, I mean, there might be other spaces on campus, like I could see maybe in STEM or maybe in courses where the instructor doesn't have an equity stance. Um, I know there are instructors that may say something like, look around, you know, everyone's not going to be here by the end of the semester, you know, and that creates a sense of comp competition and a sense of urgency. Um, so I don't want to misspeak and say that it just doesn't happen at the community college level. I would say similar to Denise, it doesn't happen in my classroom because that's not what I'm about. And that's not the space that I want to create for students. And it really is about, I mean, I tell them all the time that, you know, in my opinion, college is about jumping through hoops and I'm not trying to set the hoop on fire. I'm not trying to make my class, you know, have spikes through the hoop. I want it to be as comfy and, and, and not easy because it needs to have rigor, but I want I want them to succeed. I'm not trying to be a, an obstacle. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think, you know, uh, and my question was, yeah, maybe irrelevant to this discussion, but um, it's just something I've been wondering about. And also I went to college a long time ago and probably it was a different situation. <laughs> I think the world has gotten slightly nicer maybe in some ways slightly <laughs> we can i i hope that we're more aware of how we can be nicer how about that <laughs> that's what i think about um i think we're out of time franny uh so i'm not sure if you want to wrap this up yeah or kind yeah of i think we better wrap it up um first of all thank you for being here to our wonderful guests and thanks for staying a little bit over and um, everybody in the chat, uh, also thanks for your great comments and questions. And again, apologies to everyone about the closed captioning. That's completely our mistake and we're gonna correct that. So um, it, the next liquid margins will be sometime in March and we'll let you all know. Um, and uh, it's just been a really, wonderful and fruitful conversation and thank you Aaron for moderating from your beautiful home <laughs> yeah I know uh okay great um so again there'll be a recording of this hopefully by next week and we'll send that out to everyone who came here today so again thank you Denise and Carmen this is so wonderful and we will see you next time on Liquid Margins.